Yeah, um, good evening. Um, this, my name is uh, Helma Lutz. I'm the acting director of the Cornelia Goethe Center. And it is my um, honor and my great pleasure tonight to welcome Kathy Davis, uh, who is going to give the lecture Who Owns Intersectionality. Born in the USA, Kathy Davis is a trained psychologist and became known for her work as a distinguished scholar in social sciences. Most of her life, she lived in Europe. She's uh, currently a visiting professor at the Free University of Amsterdam. She has also worked at the University of Utrecht, the Netherlands, and she was a visiting professor at universities in the US and in Sweden. Also, she was a holder of the Maria Yahuda guest chair at the university in Bochum. And this is just to name a few uh, of her uh, professorships. Kathy Davis <clears throat> was a feminist activist already during her studies at the University of Bielefeld, uh, Germany, in, back in the 1970s. And she became one of the most well-known academics in the field of gender studies. Until today, she published 12 books and countless articles in books and journals. During a period of 13 years between 2003 and 2017, she was the editor of the European Journal of Women's Studies where she published a huge amount of editorials using current debates on cultural and political topics as stepping stones into topical feminist debates. In much of her work, Kathy Davis addresses feminist dilemmas. In some way, the addressing of ethical and social dilemmas, one can say, became a trademark for her. <laughs> In her writings, she always demonstrates that approaching a subject from your own feeling and discomfort can lead to innovative findings if you use them as a starting point for investigation. With the title of her first book, one can say that in her research, she always puts power under the microscope. A theme that plays a role in her writing and teaching um, are, is uh, to look at practices and discourses on the body. And here I can mention um, some of her books like Reshaping the Female Body, The Dilemma of Cosmetic Surgery, or the book The Making of Our Bodies Ourselves, How Feminism Travels Across Borders, or the book Embodied Practices, Feminist Perspectives on the Bodies. In her latest monography, Dancing Tango, Passionate Encounters in a Globalized World, which actually recently appeared in German under the title Tango Tanzen, Kathy deals with the passion as a social science subject, which is Passion is a clearly a complicated subject, I think, for social sciences and for feminists. If you want to characterize uh, Kathy's um, work, uh, her oeuvre, one needs really to mention the intellectual space in which she herself traveled between the US and Europe, but more important, her interest in traveling theories as in one can say an in-between space between countries and continents. Kathy Davis has written about a broad scale of themes. For instance, she deals in her work with feminist methodology by asking how a feminist researcher can make theories work, how one can write academic texts playfully, and what does it take to get published in international journals, or also another article uh, she wrote on bringing in the eye in academic writing. Those are uh, some of the texts in this area uh, she has written. 
It is also in this context that the connection between feminist theory and critical methodology uh, that Kathy Davis started to deal with intersectionality as a heuristic device long before many other gender studies colleagues in Europe did so. Her article, Intersectionality as a Buzzword, um, and the subtitle is A Sociology of Science Perspective on What Makes a Feminist Theory Successful, is one of the most quoted articles on intersectionality. Kathy and I know each other since a long time. We became friends in the late 1980s when we both lived in the same neighborhood in Amsterdam. Since then, we have continued to practice intellectual friendship and support. We have written and edited many texts together and we are currently co-editing the Routledge Handbook of Intersectionality Studies. Among the many things that I learned from Kathy is to never let go curiosity in complicated issues and the need to deal with our own and others vulnerabilities. And last but not least, to support each other in difficult times. Kathy, we are looking forward to your lecture, Who Owns Intersectionality? Well, <laughs> Thelma, that was quite an introduction. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, well, um, I'm really um, honored to be invited to give a talk um, in this series. And um, uh, I'm very sorry uh, that I can't be there in Frankfurt to give it. Um, but um, thank, uh, um, well, this is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can um, um, it, with this particular format. And many thanks to Lucas for making sure that everything goes so well with the technology. Um, in, in many ways, well, let me see. First of all, let me start up my uh, PowerPoint here. Okay. Okay. Um, it's very fitting uh, for me to uh, give this particular talk for an event that's taking place in Frankfurt um, because um, the conference, the, the very well-known conference celebrating intersectionality, which was held in Frankfurt in 2009, was in many ways um, the starting point of some of the debates I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, so I'm not going to um, give an overview of the history of intersectionality or all the reasons why it became such an important um, theoretical contribution within gender studies, because I'm assuming that all of you um, know a lot about that already. Um, what I'm going to do is to talk about some of the more um, recent debates about intersectionality and in particular, the transatlantic debates. Um, as Helma has already said, I've been writing about intersectionality for many years. And to be honest, um, I thought I had said what I had to say about it. Um, however, when these debates um, began, about what had happened to intersectionality and particularly what had happened to it after it traveled to Europe, I, I really couldn't resist and had to jump into the, into the fray again. And Helma has given you some idea about the kind of person I am and why I do that kind of thing. <laughs> um, okay, so why did I feel that I had to start um, writing about intersectionality again? Um, there have, of course, um, always been lots of debates about intersectionality. I've written about these debates in my 2008 article, Intersectionality as Buzzword. And in that article, I argued that these debates are in fact a sign of the strength of the concept of intersectionality. Um, in a later piece uh, called Intersectionality in Transatlantic Perspective, which was published in a volume by um, Cornelia Klinger and Gudrun Axelie Knapp. 
I ended on a very hopeful note about the differences in the debates about intersectionality on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I said that they were instructive and that we could all learn valuable lessons from each other. And I even wrote as the final sentence that taking these debates together will allow us to have our cake and eat it too. Um, in hindsight, this final sentence uh, was overly, it proved to be overly optimistic. <laughs> um, the debates that have emerged in the past decade um, have not only been heated, and I think debates are always heated, so there's nothing wrong with that, but um, they've also been extremely contentious and full of accusations and name calling. In fact, um, the US uh, gender and gender studies and African American studies scholar Jennifer Nash um, has called them the intersectionality wars. So she places them right up there along with the sex wars um, that which polarized feminists throughout the 1980s and some of you may remember them. So today I'm going to talk about these debates, the intersectionality wars. Um, I should say right off the bat that I'm not a disinterested objective observer in these debates. Um, this is not just because I've written about intersectionality myself and my own work has been criticized in these debates. More importantly, the, the debates have been framed as a contest between European and US intersectionality scholars. Although I was born in the United States, my academic work has taken place in Europe. I consider myself a European intersectionality scholar. As a longtime editor of the European Journal of Women's Studies, I have encouraged European scholarship on intersectionality and have been actively involved in soliciting and editing countless contributions to intersectionality studies from European scholars. I have often felt um, uncomfortable and at times unfairly maligned in certain characterizations of European intersectionality scholars. Um, however, this does not mean that I think these debates aren't very important, they are. My contribution today is in the spirit of engaging in, in a productive and constructive, hopefully constructive dialogue about issues that are important to feminist intersectionality scholars on both sides of the Atlantic. I also want to follow through on Anne Phoenix's call in her in her in the first lecture of this series for speaking up and talking about our differences and having the difficult conversations that we need to have instead of trying to silence one another. So I don't think intersectionality studies is a place for cancel culture. Um, so let me start with a statement um, made by Kimberly Crenshaw 20 years after she wrote her first famous article introducing the term intersectionality. This was in 1989. My own use of intersectionality was just a metaphor. I was simply looking at the way all of those systems of oppression overlap. Um, the responses to this are quite foreign to my sensibilities about intersectionality. So this is what she said in, just a second. This is what she said in 2011. Crenshaw um, expressed dismay that she, uh, the dismay that she had encountered versions of intersectionality in the literature that had nothing to do with, with what she had originally meant. In fact, she sometimes couldn't even recognize the concept anymore. In 2013, Crenshaw, along with Sumi Cho and Leslie McCall, Edit, edited a special anniversary issue on intersectionality in the well-known US feminist journal Signs. Many well-known feminist scholars contributed to this special issue. Many also expressed concern that in the course of its travels, 
the meanings of intersectionality had become distorted, even corrupted, and that its initial radical political dimension had disappeared. So this is what the editors wrote in the introduction to this special issue. Our sense is that some of what circulates as critical debate about what intersectionality is or does reflects a lack of engagement with both originating and contemporary literatures on intersectionality. So the signed special issue was followed by a whole slew of journal articles and books in which US intersectionality scholars, but also some European scholars critically discussed what had happened to the concept of intersectionality and how it was being used, and as some of them argued, abused in the field of gender studies. So the concern was, what was happening? What has happened to intersectionality? Many felt that Crenshaw's work had been misread, misunderstood, or willfully or unintentionally distorted. It was not being used for the purposes for which it was originally intended. The so-called critics of intersectionality, and here um, you should know that most of the time when critics of, of intersectionality were mentioned, these were not, the writer herself was not considered a critic of intersectionality, it was always the others. So, um, the critics, the so-called critics of intersectionality were viewed with suspicion. They were referred to as, I quote, white European managerial feminists who had colonized intersectionality studies according to their neoliberal agendas. Latter-day intersectionality scholars and particularly European intersectionality scholars were accused of having whitened intersectionality and transformed it into the brainchild of feminism. Given these criticisms, it's not surprising that many of these scholars felt that intersectionality needed to be rescued from the problematic readings and post-intersectional critics that had emerged since Crenshaw first formulated it. My initial reaction to some of these statements was surprise, and I must admit dismay. I was a bit taken aback uh, to find myself placed in this group of white European managerial feminists with a neoliberal agenda. I also had some trouble situating other European intersectionality scholars, and here I'm thinking of Anne Phoenix and Helma Lutz, Mira Yuval Davis, Gloria Becker, Nina Luca, and and many, many, many more. Um, um, I, I was having trouble fitting them in this characterization. But even more important, I found it disturbing that a concept that has traveled so widely and with so much success might be considered so dangerous that it had to be rescued and returned to its origins. So this is what I want to talk, talk about today. Um, I wanna look at some of what I, I'm calling the bones of contention in this debate. And there are three that I'm going to be talking about. There probably are many more, but these are the three that I've picked to talk about today. Um, one is about the problem of misreading Crenshaw. The second is the problem of who is the rightful subject of an intersectional analysis. And the third is the question of who the theory belongs to. Um, then uh, I'm going to talk about more generally about the problem of ownership and what that means when you apply that to a theory and particularly to a theory that travels. Um, and then as final point, I'm going to look at what I consider the real pain point in these, um, in these debates. And of course, I'm going to make some suggestions about what I think would be a more constructive way um, to talk about intersectionality. Okay, first um, bone of contention. Um, um, this is that Kimberly Crenshaw's original articles from 1989 and 1991 have been misread, misunderstood, and distorted. It was not 
that she hasn't been given credit for coming up with the term. Um, but many felt that this credit was little more than a hasty reference without any serious attempt being made to understand Crenshaw's intentions. These critics, and again, critics, <laughs> critics, <laughs> um, of Crenshaw were accused of treating her work carelessly and giving readings that deviated from the original or as some would put it, inaugural text. Here's a quote um, from the US gender studies scholar, Barbara Tomlinson. Many critics approach intersectionality carelessly and assume that their task is to critique intersectionality not to foster intersectionality's ability to critique so subordination. The critics of intersectionality are not only charged with careless reading, however, they are also accused of appropriating intersectionality for their own ends and failing to foster the argument Crenshaw wanted to make. Vivian May, for example, takes up this argument and complains that Crenshaw's ideas are treated as nothing new and simply there for the taking by opportunistic interlopers. While European scholars are not the only ones guilty of this, uh, the problem of misreading is regarded as, I quote, particularly acute in Europe. As Sirma Bilge puts it, continental European feminists have I quote, a certain propensity to overly academic contemplation and meta-theoretical discussions. This presumably explains why they have missed the insights that have already been so well articulated by Crenshaw. This departure from, from intersectionality's initial vision requires that we return to and re-engage with the originating text by Crenshaw. Of course, not everyone ag ag agreed that intersectionality needed to be rescued from its latter day critics. Jennifer Nash calls the insistence on returning to Crenshaw's text originalism. Originalism assesses all later feminist work on intersectionality in terms of how loyal it is to the original. This assumes that there is only one true and pure reading of intersectionality, the one closest to how it was written or intended. In Nash's view, this belief in one true meaning is a fantasy because all critique reworks the original and generates new meanings, including the calls to originalism. In other words, rescuing intersectionality and returning to the original text is a mission impossible. But more importantly, this rescue operation is itself a political move. The rescuers are, are being dishonest in her view about their own agendas. They have very real concerns, concerns which have much more to do with their own context and the political situation in the United States than with the political, con the political context in which intersectionality has been taken up in Europe. So what was, or what is this agenda? Um, and this brings me to the second um, bone of contention. Um, the, the primary concern among those anxious to rescue intersectionality from its European critics is that the experiences of US Black women are no longer the primary subject of intersectional analysis, and that the US Black feminist scholars have been pushed out of intersectionality studies. So here is um, Gail Lewis, who is a UK um, sociologist and gender studies scholar, and she has asked, where are the legitimate subjects of intersectionality? What has happened to them? Uh, in her view, it's original therapeu uh, therapeutic, theoretical subjects um, are the living, breathing, multiply inscribed empirical, empirical subjects it sought to bring to visibility. That is black women and other women of color in the United States. In her view, 
women of color have been displaced by white European feminists. She misses the work of black feminists being cited in intersectionality literature. When they are, she argues that when they are included in conferences and forums, it is only as a token black woman. She describes her own experiences as a woman of color at the Frankfurt Conference on intersectionality where she had been asked to speak but had been unable to do so. Um, and she describes sitting in the audience and feeling that it was impossible to talk about the toxic effects of, of racialization that were emotionally alive there. She, um, and she, she claimed that along with, with her own feelings, also the uh, um, uh, others who can't avoid knowing that they are race subjects also felt uncomfortable and silenced. Um, and this was in fact, just one more example of the problem that intersectionality set, uh, intersectionality set out to alleviate in the first place, the hegemony of white gender studies. So I'm going to leave aside um, the issue. Well, uh, clearly, the important uh, the the importance of her experience, um, um, but also what ha what happened at the conference, um, the content of the conference, the makeup of the, the 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 speakers, and how other participants actually felt at the conference. Um, what I want to talk about now is what happened to this description that Gail Lewis gave of her experiences at the conference. Um, it was quickly taken up by other US intersectionality scholars who had not attended the conference, but nevertheless saw it as proof that, a that, that women of color are not authorized to speak about race in Europe and that European feminists are guilty of actively participating in a regime of racial Europeaniz Europeanization. That's Tom Lenson again. Um, as not, uh, not surprisingly, not everyone agreed with this argument that or with the argument that the experiences of women of color should be the focus of every intersectional analysis. Um, the US-based queer theorist Jasper Puar, for example, has argued that, the, that this focus ends up producing women of color as the inevitable other. Intersectionality always produces an other, and that other is always a woman of color who must invariably be shown as resistant, subversive, and articulating a grievance. She called this ironic othering. Um, and while this ironic othering um, is very, uh, enables a specifically black feminist uh, perspective, it does not do justice in her view to the lived intersectional subjectivities of women of color. Moreover, it reifies their subjectivity as always anchored in difference from white women. Um, so here's another intervention in this particular debate uh, from Devon uh, Carbido, who's a US scholar of legal studies and critical race theory. He argued that it is the strength of intersectionality that it can offer a broad framework for analyzing the multiplicities of all identities and configurations of power. It is, it is a mistake, he writes, to conceptualize intersectionality as a race to the bottom. Intersectionality is a map of social structure that accounts for the privilege and the and the oppressed, the margins and the center. So for Carbido, intersectionality does not have to be reserved for the multiply marginalized. It can also include high status intersectionality, even for example, the affluent white male heterosexual. Um, I quote, framing intersectionality as only about women of color gives masculinity, whiteness and maleness an intersectional pass. So these scholars raise the question of whether a focus on black women's experience will automatically make an intersectional analysis more critical or relevant in a, in a specific situation. Does asking questions like, which difference makes a difference in terms of power? 
how do they make a difference and which actions facilitate or obstruct social change? Do these questions automatically mean that the importance of race in general is being denied? Not everyone would agree. But even if we would acknowledge that the importance of race has not been denied, another concern still needs to be addressed. Namely, has intersectionality been snatched away from the hands of its rightful owners, feminists of color? And so this brings me to the, th the third bone of contention. Whose theory is it? Some have argued that intersectionality is and should be synonymous with black feminist theory. As Jasper Puar puts it, any feminist of color who does not use it or prefers another theory, and that in her case, that, that's true, um, uh, is considered a race traitor. So Sirma uh, Bilge criticizes European feminists for treating intersectionality as something that was already or was always in the air and was transformed into the brainchild of feminism rather than an anti-racist intervention by black feminist scholars. Barbara Tomlinson sees the appropriation of intersectionality as a particularly European act. She is critical of what she sees as I quote, the superiority of white European thinking over the, the parochial thinking of black American feminism. She blames this on the overall denial of race and racism in Europe. Europeans prefer to see race like the legacy of colonialism as something which belongs to the past, the Holocaust or can be found elsewhere, apartheid South Africa or the United States of America, rather than something that needs to be investigated in our own backyard. Without making any reference to her own racialized position as a white woman in a country with its own problematic history of racism, slavery and imperialism, Tomlinson situates herself along with other true uh, intersection, U.S. intersectionality scholars as the gatekeepers who need to protect their theory from unauthorized interlopers. Not all U.S. intersectionality scholars share this view. Um, Jennifer Nash once again <laughs> gives an interesting rejoinder to Tomlinson in her book Black Feminism Reimagined. And here let me put in a plug for her book. I think it's one of the one of the smartest things that has been written about intersectionality in the last uh, 10 years. And I think it's a must read for all of us who are interested in intersectionality. Um, Jennifer Nash does not think that intersectionality belongs to black feminism or should be synonymous with black feminist theory. She takes a different and in my view, much more radical tack. Nash argues that black feminism itself needs to be broadened. It should not be the special province of women of color, nor should black women be forced to embody black feminism. Instead, she wants to see more attention given to the writings of black feminists within critical inquiry more generally. This is a much more ambitious pro uh, project than protecting intersectionality as the exclusive province of US black feminism. So this was very brief, but um, um, so far I've described these three, what I would call three bones of contention in the intersectionality debates. Um, so now I wanna to turn to um, the issue of ownership um, because I think it underpins all of these debates. And I wanna address um, some of the negative consequences I see um, for how, um, for um, linking ownership and, and theoretical production, um, um, the, and the negative consequences this has for, um, for doing critical inquiry in general. Okay, first of all, um, let me make a strong statement. Theories are not property. Obviously, the person who coins a theory, as Crenshaw did, 
deserves to be credited for it, um, for what she did. And she deserves to be cited properly. I think we all know, um, uh, know about that. Um, but, but giving credit has not really been the issue in the intersectionality debates. The issue at stake has been one of faithfulness. Have subsequent scholars of intersectionality remained faithful to the original text? Um, I would like to ask you to consider just for a moment the utter boredom that would ensure, uh, ensue if we simply parroted the ideas of others. Just imagine three long decades of merely rehashing Crenshaw's initial text. This is not what scholarly work is about. Scholarly work involves taking up ideas, reworking them, elaborating them or criticizing them and finding new ways to deploy them. In fact, any critical inquiry requires, um, compels us to do exactly that. Does this mean that we will always like what happens to the original text or that we will invariably agree with the ways that it has been criticized or put to use? Of course not. As we have seen, not everyone has been happy with how intersectionality has been used and these use, uses need to be the subject of critical debates. But the debate should be about what kind of work the theory does in a particular context and not about who has the right of ownership. In my view, a much more useful metaphor than ownership for critical theorizing can be found in the field of feminist translation studies. And I actually think they have a lot to say about, um, about any traveling theory and how we should think about theories in general. Um, in her work um, on how feminism travels across borders, um, Anna Leuvenhaupt-Singh has suggested that faithless appropriation should be the feminist strategy par excellence. Our willingness to, as she puts it, uproot, displace, and transform are what make our inquiries critical. So instead of a faithful dedication to the original, faithless appropriation should be the norm of critical feminist scholarship. Issues of ownership, of course, always arise when theories start traveling. That is when they are taken up in different disciplines, in different parts of the world, um, at different moments in time, and when they are used for different academic and political purposes. As we've seen in the intersectionality debates, the fact that a theory travels does not guarantee that it will ma maintain its initial critical intent. We know from Edward Said, that, who coined the concept of traveling theory, that traveling theories are always a response to a specific social, historical, and political context. No theory is inherently critical. What may be subversive in one context um, may serve the status quo in another. As Jennifer Nash puts it, in order to think critically about why and how intersectionality has traveled, we need to remain open both to the fact that theories transform, move, wane, develop, and morph, and to the fact that their movements are political and institutional questions. This means looking much more closely at how and why intersectionality is taken up in particular places and at particular moments and what kind of work it does or doesn't do. And I'm sure uh, when she talks in, in this um, uh, lecture series that she'll be addressing some of these issues. In my view, the tragedy of the intersectionality debates or wars is not that there has been a shortage of critiques about how the concept has been used. The problem has been that these debates have been defensive and often accusatory. They have not only led to misguided attempts to protect, protect intersectionality from its critics, more seriously, they have failed 
to encourage scholars of intersectionality to think transnationally, to be respectful of our differences and to find ways to learn from one another. So this brings me to my final point. Um, what is preventing us from having transnational debates that are respectful and mutually beneficial? Um, and I would argue that this is because we are not addressing the elephant, elephant in the room. And I'm going to put up a, um, an image for you. And I want you to see this image um, while I'm talking about what, what I think the elephant is in this particular room. Um, the elephant in the room um, in, inter in the intersectionality, intersectionality debates is racism. Race is the pain point in the intersectionality wars. Uh, the debates about intersectionality are dominated by the fear that if race is not the central access, axis of analysis, intersectionality will lose its critical edge. If women of color are not the central subjects of intersectionality, their experiences will once again fall between the cracks of feminist scholarship. If feminists of color are not the central producers and users of intersectional theory, their knowledge production will be devalued and silenced as it has been so often been in the past. Jennifer Nash noted once that the debates about intersectionality reminded her of a line by the black feminist poet Entuzake and, um, and Shange. And this is the line in her poem. Somebody almost walked off with all my stuff. Nash argues that the emotion of defensiveness is distinctive for black feminist scholars who fear that white women have stolen their intersectionality. She understands the emotion all too well. She also can appreciate why it is deeply appealing as an ethically virtuous practice. Nevertheless, she believes that, that defensiveness keeps um, US black feminist theory fundamentally stalled and it is ultimately self-defeating. Instead, she wants to imagine other less toxic ways of being a black feminist scholar and of doing black feminist work in the academy. Make no mistake, the fears about racism are not without reason. European feminist scholars have too often been silent about their own racialized histories, as well as the current realities of racism in Europe. Europe has too often situated itself as tolerant and democratic, despite the realities that belie this. For this reason, calls to focus on race and racism in Europe are both timely and absolutely necessary. Nevertheless, one can ask whether intersectional analysis is the only and indeed even the best way to put race and racism on the feminist agenda. Criticizing intersectionality or taking Crenshaw's work in directions she did not initially envision are not, in my view, automatic signs of white privilege at work. What the intersectionality wars have shown is how important it is that researchers on both sides of the Atlantic reflect on their own positionality. As European feminist scholars, we, ha we have the responsibility to think critically about our social location, our historically shaped complicities with our national histories, and our own inevitable blind spots and biases. One of the ironies of the US response to European scholarship on intersectionality is that while European feminists have constantly been positioned in terms of their color, their nationality, white managerial women, and their colonial history, US scholars interested in rescuing intersectionality have rarely accounted for their position um, for their uh, color, for their national history, or for their possible biases. One could argue that there has been a lot of US centrism going on in this debate, and it should have been, um, and it needs to be critically reflected. 
it is in my it is my view that combating race and racism is not helped by taking the moral high ground, whether it is based on victim emotionality or based on situating oneself as one of the few good whites. We do not just fight. Uh, uh, we do not just fight racism because we are its victims or self-declared saviors. We fight it because we are against it and want to change the world which promotes it. So let us think about how we can have the conversations we need to have and to have them in ways that allow us to listen to one another and reflect on both our differences and the things we care about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. This was um, really um, shaking up, I think, our, um, at this uh, time of the day, also shaking up our brains and um, uh, being also um, very, um, very fruitful, very provocative uh, at the same time. Um, so, yeah, and the fact, um, my question would be actually um, how, um, something that you said at the end, maybe we can uh, talk a bit more about this. Um, you said that, uh, in fact, um, there is a lot of US centrism in this debate, and that, um, uh, actually, um, we should um, take account of our own um, positioning uh, in this debate and our own social position in, uh, in society um, and be critical about our own location. Uh, so when um, um, here in Germany, as you know, um, talking about um, racism is a very uh, complicated issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the term itself um, is not really used in, in scientific debates. Uh, and uh, so in a way I can, um, I would say uh, talking about our own location does mean to talk about uh, the um, yeah, the history of um, the, or the academic history of of denying uh, um, or of not using this term, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, I, I would say um, we did pick up intersectionality because it was a way to talk about racism in uh, in Germany and mm -hmm. also racism in the context of uh, of uh, gender relations. So. Um, I'm very torn um, uh, with this, uh, also with this uh, criticism, because on the one hand, I think uh, in general, I would agree with a lot of critics saying that intersectionality um, can be used and probably is used by some in a managerial uh, way to replace um, um, politics of, of uh, uh, difference, for instance, or, or replace um, the, um, the whole debate about um, diversity, and it is used also in, in uh, diversity politics. Uh, so uh, I would say there, I, I would agree with, um, with those critics uh, saying that there is misuse um, of, uh, of the concept. On the other hand, I think um, you really touched the a sore spot by saying that um, it is very much um, the, the the critics very much uh, address um, um, persons um, who are uh, who are um, in the middle of this uh, and and address uh, um, white women as or white academics as being. Um, um, yeah, a problem for, for this debate. So maybe you can say something more about um, this um, a fruitful way uh, to, to um, engage in, uh, in this, in this um, 
mm -hmm. what uh, 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 Jennifer Nash called the intersectionality wars. Yeah. Um, well, of course, I. I um, well, first of all, let me be very clear that I'm. I would never ever say that I um, think that it's a bad thing to. Uh, to be critical of any of the ways that intersectionality has been used. I think that's what we do. I think that's what we should be doing um, every moment <laughs> that we're that we're breathing. <laughs> that um, as scholar, as critical scholars, we're looking at things critically, and and there um, there have been intersectionality has had such a uh, trajectory and it's used in so many different ways that of course you're not going to like all of the ways that it's used. Um, so I'm not um, I'm not making any kind of argument about about having these um, critical discussions, um, but I think even and you used it yourself. This um, there are uh, people that I would call um, white European or white European managerial feminists. Um, so I'm thinking um, I actually wouldn't. Uh, um, I think that you should be careful using um, uh, an expression like that. And let me give you a, an example of my own um, with diversity uh, management or um, diversity programs. I mean, certainly I have um, um, looked at them with a critical eye for many years. Um, at the same time, um, I, I think I, I would be... Um, um, reluctant to dismiss all of the people who are involved in diversity programs or um, diversity policy um, um, as managerial feminists. And let me give you a good example of someone I think we would could all agree is not a managerial feminist, and that's Sarah Ahmed, who worked mm -hmm. on diversity um, programs for many, many years and wrote books about it. And she she was very clear about how uh, about her own ambivalence and at the same time what they were trying to do and that um, that it was it was complicated. So I think you know that th we need to talk about um, the uh, we, we need to look at critically at these practices, but I think um, um, a, a, a basic assumption of that that or, or or let's say an interest in in where people are coming from with these programs and why what they see themselves as doing i think that kind is a kind of conversation that we should be able to have and i find these terms like managerial feminist dismissive and not helping helping us have that have that discussion that we need to have thank you and um um Yes, maybe. Uh, I, I mean, I think I would like to ask: Do you have? I mean, do you see any examples of people who are engaged in work around intersectionality where you think that these people are so um, that that it wouldn't be useful to have a discussion with them? Are they so so far away and so so on the other side of the fence that we can't even talk to them? I mean, it doesn't seem to me that kind of field. I mean, I think there are areas where you could have that <laughs> that sense. It doesn't. There's no point in having a discussion with these people. But I don't feel that way in in inter, intersectionality uh, studies of what whatever um, whatever form it takes. I think that, that that we we can we need to have these discussions. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. We need to have the discussions and. Um, uh, and you have shown us the elephant in the room, uh, which um, is uh, obviously always uh, complicated to address. Um, but it is important uh, to uh, to address the elephant. So that was a very strong uh, picture that you you've shown, uh, um, because um, it is not uh, small. Um, mm -mm. It is not a small. Um, issue. Yeah. Oh, maybe somebody else wants to ask the next question. Lena? Um, you have to unmute, Lena. Your microphone is muted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. That was really a very, very clear and great talk. And I'm, um, yeah, um, 
the positions you've described, I thought of different situations, you know, also one conference in Amsterdam where we had exactly this situation. And I'm thinking, I think it's very good that you mentioned the pain, you know, because these are extremely painful experiences that you um, have when the racism you've been subjected to is not recognized. And if you're in that position, it's actually very difficult to take the perspective of the other. Yeah, the other would be a European perspective. And um, in that situation, it was clearly impossible to get another uh, perspective across, not as substituting the reality of the US um, um, you know, being subjected to racism experience, but that there are many forms of oppression and um, um, which continue historically for a long time also mm -hmm. in other contexts. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm still uh, wondering what kind of um, um, mediation could make, the, could make it possible to take the perspective um, what would make it possible for the uh, US uh, feminists who are critical of um, the you know, European usage of um, uh, intersectionality to um, enable them to see that there might be different perspectives? Yeah, um, well, um... <sighs> I mean, first of all, the, what you say about pain, I mean, I think that's almost always when, when you have a, a, have a debate that is so, um, so contentious and so, uh, and, and, and so, um, well, it's so, 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 so difficult to listen to one another. I mean, there's usually some pain involved. So you have to, um, I mean, there, that, that, that's the first thing that you have to pay attention to, or you, you can't avoid paying attention to it, or you shouldn't avoid paying attention to it, I would, would say. Um, but um, I, I don't think I'm arguing that someone has to take the, um, understand or take the position of the of the of, of 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 someone they don't agree with, um, I just think um, uh, that we need to we need to learn to listen to one another and 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 I mean I found I also found with with some of the the reactions to the European discussions about intersectionality that they were they were so flattened out and not um, <laughs> I mean it's, you know I wondered if they'd even read um, the articles that were being criticized or had made any attempt to kind of understand where the, where this was where this was coming from so I mean I do I, I mean I actually do believe you you need to you need to situate yourself I think both I, I think anyone in any debate needs to situate the, situate themselves that's that, that's important and and the, 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 then the second thing is to listen to what the what the other person is saying and then have the <laughs> then have the, um, the discussion. <laughs> if, if I can um, add, I, um, uh, I, I should have better said, how is it possible to understand different kinds of pain? You know, this is what I meant with how, how would it be possible to understand, you know, let's say from um, a US perspective, um, you know, which is so urgent in many ways, a U.S. Black perspective, how would it be possible to understand other kinds of pain, let's say, in a European context? Well, um, say we take, just take, um, um, take, for example, this idea that if you have this idea about um, that, that, um, 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 that discussions about, um, oh, let, let's see, I have to backtrack how I'm going to say this. Um, if, if you assume that the way, the way you're, 
your perspective, say your perspective on the history of race, racism in the United States, that's born of your, you've, the, 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 your own experiences are involved in that, the history of the country, what's going on at, the, at this particular moment. I mean, that, that's all, um, that's where you're coming from. At the same time, if you have a sense that, um, um, that ideas, they, they, they travel to other places and they're taken up in other places and people do other things with them. Just the sense that, that um, um, the United States, it's not the same, the United States is one particular place, even though I think many people feel that it's the center of the world and they have all kinds of encouragement to think that way, um, it's not really true. And that there are other parts of the world where, where people also have pain and where they, they have histories and, and, um, and that there's not, um, um, I mean, that's why I think um, feminist translation studies are often so exciting because they assume that, that, we're, that, that we have all kinds of differences and that the only way we can understand each other is try to make these kind of translations for one another of where we're where we're coming from and that and and realizing that you'll never understand everything and I actually think that's a very good starting point for um, I mean you have the intention of of of, of understanding someone else's pain and you're willing to listen to that um, and at the same time this realization that you know can you understand everything uh, probably <laughs> probably not and you know the, the, you know, see see what you could do with a with a with an attempt to have a conversation. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your 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 question, yeah. but that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, um, Mayana, Mayana Schmidtbaum. So to unmute. Um, thank you. Kathy, for this really great talk. I'm still thinking about the images you used and uh, I really think it's very, yes, very interesting. Of course, it's the, the elephant, we already talked about the elephant in pain, but I'm thinking also about the, the concept of ownership. Mm -hmm. And um, so perhaps uh, I'm just, um, thinking that perhaps it's um, it's a protected area, ownership as a protected area. And perhaps sometimes those face, fences which um, surround or uh, the, the, these, this protected area are needed. That's what I'm thinking about. So mm -hmm. perhaps it's, yes, it's also a question of time. So sometimes it's needed to have um, something for one's own um, with fences around and then to have the, yes, the space and the, the con yes, the, to be confident I can elaborate my thoughts, my, my um, yes, my, my thinking and then uh, we can talk between the fences and we can, mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, you, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm just, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just um, playing with those images and this concept of ownership to own ideas or thoughts. It's really very strange, um, a strange thing, a strange concept. And I, I only can understand this concept in terms of um, to, yes, to have a protected area to, to work. And then um, after this, we can contest, can, um, yes, um. can discuss. Uh, it's, I mean, I just want to make sure that I'm that I'm understanding what you're. Uh, yeah. So you're talking about your you're you're working on your own ideas, well, your own ideas. Is, Inspired by talk your about that too. But, <laughs> okay, but you're you're yeah. you're doing your work yeah. in a in a protected space, and um, and when you, um, 
but at some point um, you're going to um, uh, your ideas are going to you're going to bring your ideas out into public discourse and that's where the problem of ownership um, becomes a problem or an issue mm -hmm. that's where um, um, as soon as you start talking about your ideas with uh, with a broader audience then you're going to have people reacting to what you've said and and, and we all know I think that that's a very um, scary moment. I mean, many of us, you know, it, it, it's frightening to um, put what you've, what you put your, your, your love baby out, out in, um, in the public domain and have people um, say things about it that maybe misunderstand you or say things that are not, um, that are not pleasant to hear, but I'm not sure how, 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 how we can ever get around that. I mean, it just seems that that's, um, I mean, for example, I probably all of us um, thought of theory in terms of schools or directions, or you know, and you you learned you learned the you studied the work of a theorist, and you had to replicate it um, exactly. And there were all these debates about whether you fit in the school or didn't fit in the school. And for me, um, that is a, a, a that is a very retrograde notion of theory. I think I think that's a very a, a deeply wrong version of theory <laughs> because I think um, most theories that 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 are meaningful for for a broader audience they'll travel so they'll be taken up by all these different audiences and then the theory immediately becomes it's no longer the the, the property of the person who wrote it or even the property of those who faithfully um, reproduce it, but it becomes um, something that belongs to a lot of people who are engaging with it. And then I think we need to have different ways of thinking about, I think about this, uh, it, 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 it's hard for me then to, to bring together this idea of ownership with once, the, once theories are out in the open, unless you really don't want to have discussions about them at all, you want to have them um, I mean, some people feel that way about um, the Bible. Um, other people don't. <laughs> so, yeah, Lena. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, the, before Lena asks the question, maybe Lucas also wants to ask a question. I come back to you, Lena. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a, a question also regarding maybe a, a contention. Um, between between two things, um, when we use intersectionality, for example, in contexts where um, it doesn't primarily concern Black uh, U.S. American women, for example, when um, I think it's of course still important to always ask, like uh, Matsuda said, the other question still ask about mm -hmm. race, even though maybe it's not uh, very primarily there and um, still maybe ask how does whiteness kind of figure into this? So that is, uh, I found that very important that it's not just in, in, um, in the context where it's uh, obvious, clear racism uh, at play, that we still ask the question about race. But if we then um, take a look at, at ca categories like whiteness or um, um, also in men as, as a category kind of denormalizing these or uh, de-universalizing these categories. Is there maybe a tension also between uh, deconstructing that, 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 that norm and uh, really getting away the focus from groups that are marginalized and then again just focusing on maybe on for white men or whiteness. So I, I find it hard to, to navigate that mm, kind yeah. of. Okay. Um, okay. So first of all, um, I think in most cases, since um, um, racism is, is so um, prevalent in the world that most of us live in, um, and it's certainly uh, part of all of, of, of all of our histories. Um, I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, I, I think you can look at, at just about anything that's going on around you, and you'll 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 be able to see. Um, the, the effects of racism. <laughs> um, but having said that, as a, as a researcher, um, and, uh, uh, you know, and you you're looking at a particular group or a particular context or 
um, a particular event. And, and, and as a researcher, I think you need to ask this question, what do I need to, how can I use intersectionality to give the most critical possible analysis of this situation, what's going on in this particular situation. And I would, I would argue that we need to leave space for the fact that while racism is everywhere, you, ubiquitous and needs to be analyzed, there, might, there can be a research um, uh, context in which it's not the primary axis that, 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 that you need to look at to analyze how, what's happening in terms of power in this situation. And that, 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 it, that it's not an automatic um, it, it, that it shouldn't be an automatic. I mean, that would be um, the way I would see that. And I think, and, and I would like to get away from, and this is, was part of the European debates, which I actually found very helpful, <laughs> that um, you can make a map, you can make it a, a map of differences and, and you, know, you could come up with, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> 20 differences, 30 differences. I mean, you can, you can make this map and you can apply it to any situation, um, but that's not a critical analysis, particularly that's a map. <laughs> and a critical analysis, you have a, you have a, you have a question and you, have a, you, you, you wanna find an answer to your question. And then often you, you find yourself um, home, honing, homing in on particular differences that are going to help you answer that question. So, um, so I would, I, I, that, that would, my position would not be that you have, that, that racism automatically makes your analysis more as radical as it can possibly be. I don't think that's true. In some cases, um, you need to be focusing on homophobia or you need to be focusing on um, the relationship between xenophobia and homophobia or um, I think that's part of what an inter intersectional analysis should be about. Um, so there, let's see. Oh yes, and I have one more thing. Um, you know, this I I found it actually very exciting, uh, and here I agree with this uh, Diva De Devan Carbado. Um, I, I I actually think intersection intersectional analysis works really well to analyze um, the powerful. <laughs> and that they shouldn't be given a pass. I mean, he says an intersectional pass. I think um, intersectionality works, works really well um, for, for analyzing um, um, masculinity, um, whiteness, um, uh, heterosexuality, um, and so on. But there are di differences. I mean, there are people who would disagree with that. Some people feel that you really should re restrict the field of intersectional uh, intersectional analysis to the most marginal um, the most marginal marginal groups. That's a discussion that you can have. Thanks, Lena. You have you have another question? Yes, it was uh, actually going in that direction, um, where um, yeah, it's uh, it's. It's being debated uh, that um, you know which areas of research are relevant. Yeah, and, and instead, there's how you described it with the the call to um, be faithful. You know, it's orthodoxy is always a reaction to uh, what seems to have been a deviation. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's the call back to. Um, um, what we should be focusing on, yeah. So is, is, is this really um, um, the matter of the debate, which, what kind of um, research we should be doing? It's not so much the question how we're doing it, but even that the topic of the research, some um, in this new orthodoxy, um, is uh, are some kinds of research not even considered um, to be um, um, worth of an intersectional analysis? Is, is, should I uh, clarify? Um, I, I mean, are some of the 
is some of the, you know, from the so-called European side, would some of the research that is being done not even be considered um, uh, worthy of uh, doing an intersectional analysis? <laughs> So I'm not sure who's to, um, uh, so who would who um, who would be taking this position? Um, I, um, maybe the, this is a, an association I have, so maybe I'm going way off <laughs> on a tangent here. But um, I, I recently read something about a, a, um, a group of activists who were calling themselves. Um, they were calling themselves, um, it, it, they, they were defining, um, um, they were defining intersectionality as exactly the same as identity politics. Uh, and they were re rejecting that because um, intersectionality, you know, they don't want to, um, they, they don't, they don't agree with that. They were using the kinds of arguments you would use against identity politics politics. And it, for me, it was a very strange, it was very strange to see that um, because I had always seen intersectionality as a reaction <laughs> to identity politics as a, a, a different way to think about identity and a different way to imagine um, politics, political activism or um, yeah. normative theorizing, not just normative theorizing. Um, but at the same time, I thought, um, should I should I reject <laughs> should I reject what these people um, are saying as just wrong? You haven't understood what intersectionality is about. And then I thought, no, <laughs> that's not what I should do. You know, if I if I take my own um, ideas seriously, then that's exactly that's very interesting. What's happened? I mean, all the all the. Um, transformations this this word has gone through in the last decades I mean and the the ways the ways it's used now that it's taken up been taken up more and more by um, by activists and it gets many different meanings that are were not the meanings that we discussed uh, so nicely in uh, in gender studies I mean they're 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 using it in a quite a different different way sometimes. But of course, that's very interesting. I think that's that we should be, we should want to understand what they're doing and not think, oh, they've taken our term away from us and we've got to get it back. <laughs> yeah, I really liked uh, what you said that no theory is inherently critical, you know, but it has to be rethought in every single context we use it in. Yeah. I mean, it may be, and I certainly um, uh, ask my, myself this regularly. I mean, I think theories, um, so I, I want to do critical, critical research. And if I think a theory is getting in the way, I mean, it's not helping me be, be critical or crit criticize whatever it is I want to cri be criticized, then it's, it's not the theory for me. It's not that it's, 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 an, it's a bad theory altogether, but it's not the theory that I, that I need to use. And I mean, that seems to be the, seems to me the, the, the question that we need to ask mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, and really to treat theories as these kind of, I, I would really advocate treating theories as these, um, uh, changing uh, amorphous <laughs> uh, bodies of thought that are, you know, where all these things are happening and happening with the theories out in the world, and um, you know, and and that, it, that 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 that's something to observe and to in investigate, but not to try to hold on to and 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 pin down and yeah. you know protect. <laughs> if it disappears, it disappears. Yeah. Off to something else. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Kathy. This was almost a very good um, summary <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of our discussion. Um, if there is no more urgent question, I would like to um, thank you very much for this fantastic talk and also for this um, for, for your engagement in um, answering our questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, it really helps us um, to 
to rethink uh, positions, um, the um, series, um, the lecture series that you are um, talking in is called um, uh, intersectionality um, at the, in a crossfire, uh, which means that um, you have absolutely wonderfully addressed the, uh, a lot of these questions. And uh, also you have shown us that it is, um, there are open questions. So we have, we cannot say within the next uh, 10 years, intersectionality will will develop in this or that direction. We can, I think, still be sure that it will still be there, but it may be used in a, a, in a very different way from you know what what, what we have been doing with it. Mm -hmm. So I think this uh, you showed us that this kind of openness is very uh, is really important. So thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank you all of you for your um, for your good questions and it was very enjoyable talking to you.